You know, sometimes I'm in the mood for something nice and new and artsy. And then I say, fuck it. Let's watch Sleepaway Camp 3 again. Angels are pretty, angels can fly, and here is an angel that can make you die. You've got no style, you've got no flair, all you do is fight and swear. So say your prayers and make amends, because your life story is about to end. Leap Away Camp 3 stars Pamela Springsteen, Tracy Griffith, and is directed by Michael A. Simpson. What's up guys, time to finally finish off the Sleepaway Camp trilogy with Sleepaway Camp 3. I don't know if I'm going to do Return to Sleepaway Camp. I watched it a few years ago. Holy shitballs. That is a really, really bad movie. Uh, just very low budget in feel. Uh, it feels like uh, almost like a family reunion of you know the crew from the first movie coming together and they got no budget whatsoever and let's just see what we can film. That's what it feels like. And so, like the Crow Wicked Prayer, I might be coaxed into reviewing it if you guys want it enough. As it stands right now, I'm gonna be happy finishing off the trilogy. And like I was saying in the other one, um, Sleepaway Camp 3 Blu-ray, so glad I have this. Mwah. This might be one of my most prized possessions, having this trilogy with the slip covers on Blu-ray. I watched the, uh, the documentary on this movie after, man. So glad I have these. But this will also be a patron request. One of my patrons, David B. Uh, I told him I would dedicate this review to him. If you have a certain tier, then you can get a review in, in your honor. And uh, he was inspired to go back and watch the Sleepaway Camp movies after I just did part two and he had a blast with them. So I'm gonna dedicate this one to him and I'm gonna be doing another movie for him next month. Uh, so David B, this one's for you, good sir. Now, to give you a quick plot synopsis on this one, it, it, this was filmed back to back with Sleepaway Camp 2. They literally, uh, you know, finished shooting 2, had a weekend, and then jumped right on to this movie. Uh, so, in this one, it's supposed to take place, I think, a year later. At the beginning of the movie, this is the only time we see filming locations outside of the, uh, the camp where they filmed in Georgia. Starts off with this uh, camper. She's about to go to newly named Camp New Horizons. It's the same camp as Rolling Hills, but we all know what happened in Rolling Hills. The, uh, the camp leaders knew what happened, but they didn't want to tell the campers that were coming there. And they're combining, um, I guess, the rich and the poor, you know, the, the, the lower class with the, the upper crust, and they're going to mix them once they get there. Some kind of social experiment. I have no idea. Uh, we got to figure out a way to get some new fresh meat on this campground for Angela to slice and dice, right? And so that's what we got to do. But we get a full frontal scene in the beginning with a fresh tattoo called Milkshake. Uh, you know, a little bit of tongue in cheek action there. And then Angela intercepts this person by the name of Mary. She runs her over with a truck and then she takes on her personality, and then she ends up going back to the same camp. The psychology of Angela Baker, I have no idea why she has to keep going back to this camp looking for new victims to kill. It's the strangest thing ever. And they don't really go too deep into Angela's psyche. There's like a scene where she's a little delusional because you know she's thinking that people like her, you know, she has that funny like Sally Field line from the Oscars, you you love me, you really love me. Um, so I think Angela just wants to be liked, uh, but she can't help herself. You know, she's a psychopath, she wants to kill. It's like an addiction. If they were wanting to get a little bit more serious with this and, and the original director of the first movie, maybe that's what he wanted to do because he was gonna go more serious. Maybe they would have went into the um, dark corridors of Angela's mind to figure out why she is the way she is. But I think it works better to be more of a uh, horror comedy slasher because at the end of the day, what are we really here for? But Angela ends up back at the, uh, the new camp or newly named camp and she does what she does best. I think she kills like 15 people in this movie. It's pretty insane. Angela could give uh, our horror icons a run for their money in the body count department. Now, some interesting stuff behind the scenes on this movie. We all know that it was filmed back to back with the first movie, but if you look at this movie, it does look different. You would swear that this movie was probably filmed a couple of years later, but it wasn't. 
Uh, same crew for the most part too, but for some reason it looks different and I think there's a reason for that. If you pay attention, there's very little interior shots in this movie. Most of it takes place outside in tents uh, and that's, you know, maybe they, they just didn't have much left of their budget because they had a deal to shoot both these movies at the same time and maybe they spent most of their time and effort and money on part two and I think that shows because I'm gonna tell you right now, two is the better movie, but having said that, after giving this a fresh watch, and guys, I don't know if I've actually ever watched all of Sleepaway Camp 3. I ended up having a pretty decent time with this one because it does try some things a little different, especially giving us a little bit of closure uh, in the, the last act. But I think there's quite a few characters in this movie that they're trying to give more of a personality to. Remember in the last review, I was talking about how the only characters that really stand out are Molly and Allie. Well, in this one... Nobody stands out as much as those two, but they attempt to give a little bit more life to most of the characters. Now, Tracy Griffith, I think she's a big standout in this, and you can tell because there's some atrocious acting in this movie, but she's probably the best actress in this outside of Pamela Springsteen. And she was originally thought of to play Angela uh, by Michael A. Simpson. But I think it was a location issue, and so they ended up going with Pamela Springsteen. But he liked her so much that he put her as the final girl in this movie. And like the last movie, you don't know if she's going to be the final girl until pretty much the, the last act. Uh, they don't really build her, you know, to be that type of character. In most slasher movies, I think in the first act, the final girl or guy sticks out like... Um, a, I guess I wouldn't call it a sore thumb, but, uh, you know, they just have different characteristics. They might be kind of like the virgin of the movie, or they might be just a little smarter than everybody else. They don't really do that with Marsha, played by Tracy Griffith. But having said that, when they do finally let her come to the forefront, I do like her. Now, speaking a bit about the psychology of Angela, uh, I started kind of asking myself questions, which I probably shouldn't have when I'm watching this movie. Um, how do you not get killed by Angela? Is there a way to not get killed by her? Because it seems like if you screw up one time, you're dead. Uh, but the question is, if you were almost perfect, I guess like Molly was in the last movie, she's still going to kill you. And I think the only reason she would kill you is if she is in danger of getting caught. And there is a scene where you got the father of one of the previous victims here, and they actually save Angela, him and Marsha. And Angela does kind of go out of her way to tell them, you know, thank you. I appreciate you helping me. Now let's jump into the kills of this movie. I think they're really fun. I don't think there's any one kill that sticks out that's better than, say, like the, uh, the outhouse kill in two. But I still think there's some fun kills in here. There's a couple of them that take place in a tent. You could tell that they were cutting corners. But uh, some that really stick out, you got this one character, Herman, played by Michael A. Pollard, a very eccentric uh, actor. Uh, he, I think he had like a career more going in the 70s. He looks very familiar. If you watch the behind the scenes, they talk about how he was kind of playing himself in the movie. He's just very eccentric, uh, kind of um, a child's mind. And he's married to Lily. They are the showrunners of this uh, new New Horizons camp but he's already cheating on his wife with uh, Sweet Pea, this young sultry blonde, and they are in the tent. And Angela gets right down to business. She grabs a freaking big stick, the same stick that she used in part two, to kill both of them. Herman gets a good impalement shot. It kind of reminded me of what Michael Myers did to the bully in Rob Zombie's Halloween. There's also this duo, I call them the firecracker duo, that they have a lot of fun with firecrackers for some reason. You don't want to do that around Angela because she'll put one of them in your mouth and then she'll light it and then the other guy's gonna wake up and he's gonna see the guy's mouth just like explode. That's a good kill, actually. You could tell that they were working on a low budget, but they were at least getting creative, doing the best they could. But the MPAA did rip this movie apart. If you remember in the late 80s, I think that's when the MPAA was just coming after slasher movies. Uh, it was almost like the MPAA could be uh, a slasher in a slasher movie coming after slasher movies because that's what they were doing and I saw the uncut footage that they cut out of this movie and oh my god this could have easily passed today and then some because it was nothing crazy now they do have this trust game in Sleepaway Camp 3 where two people get together and they uh, one blindfolds the other 
and I don't know what the point of the game is. And then they go into the woods. Actually, I do know what the point is. It's to give Angela a reason to kill somebody else. And it's fun. And so she gets in there. There's this character that's extremely racist. <laughs> and the, the young actress, she talks about it behind the scenes. She's felt so uncomfortable because she has to, like, drop the N-word a couple of times. And I was like, damn. And this poor girl, she, um, you know, you can tell she seemed very sweet. And she did not like having to do that. But sometimes actors just have to do, you know, they have to say stuff that they definitely don't agree with at all. Um, but she's the one that gets hoist up the, uh, the light pole. And then dropped. And that's one where they did a close-up, uh, you know, an insert of her face getting, you know, bashed against the concrete. But, of course, they had to take it out. Now, there are uh, some kills that I think you don't really need to show the aftermath. Because uh, there's one where this guy, Bobby, uh, he's wanting to get with Angela. But he goes a little bit too far. I think he was out of the woods, but then he went too far. And then also Angela doesn't have the hots for Bobby. She has the hots for this other guy who was with Marsha. And so... Maybe he's going to be dead by default, but uh, he gets tied to a tree, his arms, you know, and then she um, ties it to a Jeep and then she drives off and his arms get ripped off. Come back here! They showed the, uh, the scene in the uncut footage, but it looks really cheap. Uh, and I think it works so well just because of the sound effect, the bones cracking and his expression. And I think that that's one that works really well, maybe not showing so much. Now, by the time you get to the final act of this movie, you almost forget about the first movie after you've done two and three, just because they feel so far removed from what was established in the first movie. I don't mean that as a negative for the movie per se. It's just an observation. I love all three of these movies to death. And maybe it was a good reason to kind of switch gears, kind of like what they did with Prom Night. And Prom Night didn't even use the same characters, and they switched uh, subgenres. But maybe there's a lesson here for other slashers, like maybe don't lean so hard on um, key characters. Yeah, if you got a character like Sidney Prescott, of course you're going to try to ride that home as far as you can. But if they're sort of throwaway characters, even the final girl isn't that, you know, great then I think it's fine to move on and maybe even recast. You know, Friday the 13th kind of had the right idea too. They never really leaned too heavily on a character outside of, say, John, Tommy Jarvis. But I do love the final act in this movie. Uh, just because you get a little bit of closure with Pamela, uh, there's a, a, a struggle between her and Marsha, which is kind of interesting because Marsha was thought of as maybe a candidate to play Angela. So it's almost like two Angelas fighting each other you know, for the part. She's the only one that really gets a mark on Angela. She stabs her in the stomach. And I was like, oh, finally, somebody got it. You know, because Angela, she uses her um, femininity to uh, get away with things too. Not really just that, but also she's, you know, she's a petite five foot five uh, woman. And let's face it, most people aren't going to think that that person is a killer. And so they can blindside you much easier than say some six foot five hulkish jock. But it's got a great ending, you know, with the paramedics and uh, they want to kill her. They know about Angela. And of course, they, they put their guard down and she kills both of them. And then the last line of the movie, she's taking care of business. And, uh, you know, a little tongue in cheek. Just taking care of business. Before I give my rating, one last observation about this movie. I think Angela is a little darker in here than she is in part two. I don't know if that was intentional script wise or maybe... They were just kind of tired and beat doing uh, another movie back to back. They do mention that behind the scenes that even the crew, maybe they were running out of ideas. Uh, maybe they were just exhausted. They did shoot this in the, uh, the fall and they said it was freezing because they had to shoot most of the stuff outside. So maybe it comes across in the performances. And I think that's the overall vibe I get from Sleepaway Camp 3. I do have a blast with the movie, but I don't think it has the energy and I guess the fun nature of part two. Um, it feels a little bit more serious, uh, but definitely, you know, more tongue in cheek than say the first movie, right? But uh, still really fun. I would give it like a, a high humdrum as far as like slasher movies go, okay? So anyway, let me know down in the comments your thoughts on Sleepaway Camp 3. Looking forward to hearing them. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, Rudy Free for Fridays, follow me at Drum Dumbs on my socials, support me on Patreon, buy me a coffee. And I guess thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Rum them out.